Hello and welcome. Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Tonight's webinar examines the question, how do I get a better work-life balance? And the panel will provide information and strategies regarding the psychological and physical aspects of working towards achieving a better work-life balance. Before we get started, I'd like to go through some housekeeping to make this event as seamless and interactive as possible. Firstly, if you wish to ask either of the panel or myself a question throughout the webinar, please use the text chat, chat facility, which is located in the bottom left corner of your screen. You can also use this feature to post comments and technical questions or to just chat and share information between each other. To protect your privacy, you will not be able to see who has logged in tonight, but in the chat boxes you will see a first name and the initial of your surname. And if you experience any difficulty hearing the sound throughout tonight's event, please feel free to listen via the telephone by dialing the 1800 number provided in the chat box, you can see it there now, and then enter the passcode provided. We will also be launching some interactive polls throughout tonight's event. These are anonymous, so please feel free to participate. And during the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar, we will answer some of your questions, addressing the most commonly raised themes. But also please feel free to put questions up in the chat box as we go along. So today's event will be recorded and everyone who registered will be sent a link to view a copy of the recording, plus we load it up on our website later. So if there's anything you've missed, you'll be able to see it later. And also if at any stage you need to speak to someone urgently, please don't hesitate to contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So let's get started. So first I'd like to introduce our panel. Michelle Sloan, who is going to give a little wave. Say hello, hello. Michelle. <laughs> Dr. Hariana Dillon. Hi, Hi. Hariana. And Erica. So I'm Jill Mills, and Annie Miller, our manager of the practical support unit, is monitoring the live chat. So say hello to her in the chat box. So what's the, the story about work-life balance after cancer? So. When your work life and personal life are out of balance, your stress levels are likely to soar. Um, if you then add into the mix of cancer diagnosis, treatment, and the worry about your cancer coming back, it can get even harder to find the balance between work and your personal life. So whilst it is important to create boundaries between work and non-work activities, it is becoming more and more difficult due to the ever-increasing capacity of technology to connect us to our work 24-7. It can take a great deal of personal strength to create and maintain these boundaries, so ensuring that you are mentally and physically able to implement some strategies is important. So research tells us that if you're able to gain control of your behaviours, eat well, incorporate physical activity into your day, in other words, introduce a healthy lifestyle, you're in a better position to make better choices about the way you live. So this can be extremely challenging. Um, you know, when you go through cancer treatment, you tend to rely on the medical profession to sort of fix things for you, organise things. Um, but when that's all over, it then becomes over to you to start implementing changes in your life. So there are a few of the challenges. Um, so we'll go to the, our first polling, interactive polling question. So just wondering if you can identify with any of those issues that we had up there, the technology, the lifestyle, the diet, the physical activity. So if you just click yes, no, some, and we'll just see what sort of responses we get. <clears throat> totally anonymous, so it's just good to, to join in and see, see what you um, responses. That's great. A couple more. That's great, thank you. So we might move on now um, and I'll introduce Michelle Sloan. We'll get down to Michelle's first slide. So Michelle is going to talk about her personal story and her experience with cancer. So good evening, Michelle. Hi Jill and um, hello everyone and thank you um, very much for um, the opportunity to, um, to speak to you all out there in webinar land. 
feels a little bit strange, I have to say. So if I if I stumble over some things, please forgive me. Um, I I would like to I guess start off by giving you a little bit of a, a sense of who I am. I think it might make a little bit. Um, you might understand a little bit more about my, my journey and my responses if I explain to you um, a little bit about my background and how I would define myself as a person. Um, and the other thing I'd also like to say just right at the very beginning is that I can't emphasise enough how different everyone's journey is. Um, I have quite a few friends that have been diagnosed. In fact, it felt like a bit of an epidemic for a while. Um, women like me over 50 that have been diagnosed with breast cancer in my case and theirs. But I have to say that um, each of us have had a very, very different journey, uh, different responses, different reactions, and to some extent different issues and different ways of thinking about ourselves. And um, so I really do want to emphasise that what I'm sharing with you is my response and, and I guess the things that I've done, um, they might not work for you. I hope some of them will, um, but perhaps at, at the very least there'll be um, something for you to think about. Um, so if I can start with just how I would describe myself, um, I've always been, um, I've always been working. Um, I'm a working, first and foremost, a feminist, working mother, Working, working woman, always busy. Um, as I've already okay. mentioned, I'm on the wrong side of uh, 50. I had a, a baby late in life, so I had quite a few years without the responsibility of kids and a husband. Um, and I, I'm an only child, and I had an only child, more by um, in accident than intent. I was hoping for more, but that just didn't happen. Um, and now I find myself at um, the age I am, both my parents have now uh, passed away. Um, and I guess because I was always part of a very small family, my dad came here um, after the war. He was a, a, a refo from Poland. Um, family has been very important, but because I didn't have very much of it, um, my friends, and you can see some of their images there on the screen at the moment, they became um, my family and, and very important um, to me. And some of them have really been um, absolutely outstanding through um, the experiences that I've been going through over the last six months. Um, I was diagnosed uh, back in um, March um, with ductal carcinoma in situ. And um, it was a complete shock to me. I was not expecting um, it whatsoever. I had no lump. I felt perfectly fine. And I just went along for a routine mammogram. But what happened as a result of that diagnosis is it really made me think about who I was before this diagnosis. And really, probably all my life, I have put um, other people, my family, friends, um, and my work in front of me. Um, I've, I'm very um, focused on commitment and responsibility, uh, both to my work and to issues and to the people around me. And in my family, um, we just didn't get sick. Nobody ever got sick. We never thought about being sick. And if we were sick, we just soldiered on. Um, my, both my parents had very limited tolerance for, um, for illness, so I'm afraid my husband and my son are not very happy with me when they're sick because I don't think I'm a very good nurse. But um, So it was really, really difficult for me to hear that I had um, something that was wrong with me. And um, interestingly enough for me, my first reaction was, what had I done um, to let this happen to me. I took complete responsibility for it and I thought, well, I must have done something wrong in my life. I must have not been looking after myself properly or I don't know, I just felt um, to blame in some way. Um, and, you know, I would describe myself as a classic type A personality, a total control freak. And here I was in a situation where there was something going on, on in my body. I had no idea it was happening. And it was really effectively changing the course of um, my life. And I found that extremely confronting and um, quite difficult to deal with. Um, so diagnosis. Um, I've already said ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, 
the diagnosis came for me, I mean, no, it's never a good time to get a, a diagnosis of cancer, whatever its form, but it was occurring in my life at an extremely difficult time, a lot of other things going on in my life. And um, it was just a really terrible time. I really felt that um, just everything that I sort of knew and understood about my life was changing. And I felt um, complete shock and disbelief. Um, moments of anger and moments of feeling, um, you know, how could this be happening to me? I just couldn't accept, you know, here I was a person that had looked after myself. I couldn't accept that this had happened. And it led me to quite a lot of catastrophic thinking um, because, um, you know, my work and my income um, was a very important part of our family mix. My income is not a secondary income. It's very much a primary income. And my son is only 14, so I was terrified about what was going to happen to him and, and you know, how he would be cared for and a lot of catastrophic thinking. Um, and it really wasn't um, until I'd, I'd sort of settled a little bit after the diagnosis and probably really after the surgery that I started to really rethink things and take a deep breath and start to think about how I was going to manage the situation moving forward. And I, I guess I put this slide in about a wishbone, a backbone and a funny bone was I kept on thinking, well, you know, if I, what is it about me that usually sees me through situations and being essentially a fairly positive person and a person that I guess I consider myself to be a strong person and I don't take myself too seriously. I tried to find all of those kind of characteristics in myself and apply them to the situation that I found myself in. But I have to say it was not easy and it was not a straight line trajectory and I had you know good days and I had lots of bad days. So look I, I popped in the Wonder Woman slide only because well I actually loved Wonder Woman in the 70s, but <laughs> loved, loved Linda Carter, but I, I guess I felt um, you know I was being required to do an awful lot. Um, I had to keep working. Um, I didn't really have the option to stop working. I run a um, small cardiothoracic surgical research and training institute. We have a very small team. I was needed. Um, I had quite a bit of support at work, but I'll, I'll come to a little bit more about that in a moment. But I thought, well, if I look at Linda Carter and I look at Wonder Woman, I kind of think, well, what is it about me? How can I leverage my strengths? And that's really, the stuff that I mentioned earlier about um, my, my essentially positive outlook, my capacity to face a challenge and I guess at the end of the day my capacity to laugh at myself. And I must say by the time I was halfway through my radiation I was amazed at the ease with which I hope I won't insult anyone or offend anyone when I say this, but the ease with which I was able to flash my boobs in front of just about anybody who wanted to have a look. So I, I kind of tried to get into that. And I was really very, very lucky. Um, my treatment was six weeks of radiation and I'm now on tamoxifen but no chemo. So I know the journey for people um, experiencing chemo is is quite, quite different. And I, I feel very lucky that that wasn't part of my journey so far. Um, so look, post my diagnosis and post my um, treatment, um, I guess what was interesting was I, um, I had my surgery on a Wednesday and I thought I'd actually be back at work on the following Monday. And when I realised how exhausted I was Still on the Sunday afterwards, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to actually take another week. And it was in that week that I really started to self-assess and I started to think about, um, well, how, what, what's my plan? How am I going to deal with this? How do I normally deal with difficult situations? I usually develop a plan and that's pretty much what I did. Um, but it was very much an iterative process. I didn't kind of work it all out and say, you know, this is one, two and three. The first big thing was I'm going to eat whatever I want while I'm in recovery. 
So through my recovery from my surgery and then as I recovered over that six weeks before radiation started, I pigged out a bit. And when I didn't feel like I wanted to eat, I didn't eat. So normally I would really have beaten myself up about that, but I just ate what I want. I rediscovered my yoga practice and that was absolutely um, just, it's been critical for me and, and my journey. Um, I did quite a lot of walking and I did um, a lot of talking um, to a select group of, of, of friends. Um, a lot of people were, um, I think, really disturbed by my diagnosis. Lots of people kept saying to me, oh, if anyone was going to get this, it would be you and you'll be able to deal with it. And I have to say, I felt like hitting them. Um, but, um, you know, some things I just recognised I needed to let go. And I really started a process of reflection and re-evaluation. Um, I really tried to work out what was important for me um, and working on saying no, saying no to doing extra things at work, saying no to doing extra things in my community uh, because I'm also a local counsellor and really practice um, in being in the moment and I'm a person that worries a lot. I overthink things and I've really through my yoga practice tried to work on being in the moment and to let things go that that I really you know can't change and I, I, I don't know whether this will be a useful quote for you all but it's a Dalai Lama quote that really resonated with me. And it is, if a problem is fixable, if a situation is such that you can do something about it, then there is no need to worry. If it's not fixable, then there is no help in worrying. There's no benefit in worrying whatsoever. And that really resonated with me because I can worry about anything. So um, I really found that was quite helpful at work and actually gave me quite a lot of power to um, say no to things and to let certain priorities go. So I think um, that personal re-evaluation, that thinking about what really is important to me and what's really important at work and focusing on priorities at work and not being afraid to ask for help, which I might previously have thought um, as a sign of weakness and absolutely making time for myself not doing everything, not following the perfect diet, not following the perfect exercise regime, but trying to fit into my week, two or three yoga sessions and a work, walk with a girlfriend and you know a, a cup of coffee. And I'm a bit of a coffee addict. I, sorry, I haven't given that up to anybody that thinks that I should give up caffeine. I'm afraid that I just can't give co up coffee. So, um, you know, that's been a really beneficial thing for me. And you know, recognising that just not everybody can be there um, for you. It's very confronting for some people and, and really quite challenging. So for me, um, yoga has been a, a real salvation and I do absolutely believe that um, there is a strong connection between the mind and the breath. And if I can control my breath, I can control my mind. And I've been taking that into the workplace and really focusing on trying to settle myself when I feel stressed at work or when I feel some anxiety emerging around perhaps the recurrence of my cancer. I just had my six month check on Tuesday and I had a few scary moments on Tuesday and it all worked out in the end, but I, I really practiced that breath and I did find um, that it, it helped me. So peace, I'm not sure, but I think if I, if I really focus on um, trying to be in the moment and think of myself and try and put myself first, not all of the time, but the majority of the time, and do what I think is important for me, I know that I can, um, I can, you know, I can work through this and I can be... Um, I can be as good as I can be. And I've got a new little saying at work now, it is what it is. So um, I'm trying not to stress too much. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, it's a very personal account, but I hope it's useful for some of you. Okay, so we'll move on. Thank you very much, Michelle, um, to the polling question. So the question is, can you relate to Michelle's story? So yes, no, or some of it. So 
is for some people you will um, relate to what she said or just some of it. So don't be shy, give us an answer. That was great, Michelle. Thank you very much. That looks mm. about it for the poll. So now we're going to move on and I'd like to introduce Dr. Haryana Dillon, who's a research fellow at the University of Sydney. Welcome, Haryana. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for that perspective, Michelle. It really resonates with a lot of the things that um, I certainly was thinking about while I put, um, put my um, talk together for this evening. Um, so, oops, hang on a sec. Uh, I've just lost my ability to move the slides forward. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay. Um, so the concept of the, the work leisure um, idea as a dichotomy first kind of appeared in Western culture around the mid 1800s, and it was really closely associated with the um, the separation of work from home with industrialisation and from people moving into more urbanised areas. Um, one of the things that um, that occurred during the 20th century was that the concept of work evolved into one which um, w in which pleasure increased in significance, and it sort of culminated in um, the quote that you can see on the screen with anthropologists defining happiness um, as as or one of the aspects of happiness is when there is little distinction between work and play. And while many of us have the privilege of um, fulfilling, um, having work that's fulfilling and generates happiness, um, the blurring of the line between work and place resulted in adding stress to a lot of our lives, particularly with the advances in technology, which make people accessible all of the time um, and in all of the places. So many, um, many more of our, um, our society work in structured workplaces outside of the home and we've developed a culture of busyness and where, where busyness equates to being good and people who are busy have some level of um, moral superiority sometimes or, or that's often how it's portrayed. And so when trying to achieve work-life balance, there are lots of um, challenges to some of our underlying assumptions about, um, about work and leisure. So um, the work-life balance is a frequently discussed topic in the media. Um, and it, um, if you go to Google, you can um, you can find yourself about 171 million um, hits um, of, about life work balance. So that's a lot of words. Um, and in academic in the academic world, we're also actively in, um, writing about work work life balance with about 100,000 hits on Google Scholar for for this topic. So we certainly don't have all of the answers. Um, and with this many people writing about it, it suggests that it's a fairly significant challenge for us and a challenge for more affluent societies where there are lots of choices to be made. Um, and it's a challenge we don't have good solutions to as yet. And in part, we need to, um, to challenge our societal expectations, our workplaces, our systems, and indeed ourselves in order to achieve a better work-life balance. So what about life balance after a cancer diagnosis? Um, for many people after a cancer diagnosis, Life after a cancer diagnosis can be very different than how than it was previously. And for some people that's continuing to work and live during their treatment, um, living with advanced cancer that's managed either over a very short period of time or for some people over many years, um, and living with um, through and beyond in, uh, intense acute treatment. And whatever the situation is, it can mean that people with their values people and their values and priorities may change substantially. And many of the people who live and work with um, with the, the person who's had a diagnosis of cancer may not be expecting their values and priorities to change. Um, and here you can see that after a diagnosis there are a number of different concerns that people commonly report and they relate to the whole person, not just to their physical health. And I'm just going to go on quickly to highlight some of these um, concerns particularly. Um, and a word about symptom clusters, which refer to the incidence or occurrence of three or more interrelated symptoms that, because of their relationship, may actually share a common cause or may co um, compound one another. And there are some examples of them on the slide there. Um, and while some people um, can experience a spontaneous recovery of their symptoms, it's not always the case. And people may need um, to request some additional support to achieve their optimal function. Fatigue is one of the most common and distressing patient reported symptoms after a diagnosis and treatment for cancer. We don't really understand what the exact causes are, but we do know that there's an increasingly strong link between physical activity, physical function and fatigue, and I'm not going to talk any more about that because I know Erica will cover it in detail. 
Um, and there will be many other things, there are other things that can contribute to fatigue, such as depression and sleep disturbance and so on. So it's important if these issues, these are, to address these issues if they're present um, before seeking more intensive help for fatigue. Um, sleep disturbance after a cancer diagnosis is, is very common. In this study that was done in, um, in Canada, you can see here that um, around about 60% of people at the time of diagnosis were experiencing a change in their sleep patterns and were having trouble sleeping. Over time, over the next 18 months, that dropped off. But with around about 37% of the people in that study still experiencing sleep changes um, a year and a half after their diagnosis, that um, suggests it's a very significant problem for people. So, uh, and one that often goes unaddressed because people think it's not a particularly um, problematic or it's, it's not something that um, that um, they should be uh, asking their cancer doctors about, but it is a really common um, um, approach. So we would expect the population levels in the general population of insomnia to be around about 10 or 15 percent at the most. So people after cancer diagnosis are experiencing significant levels of um, of um, pain. Oh, sorry, sleep disturbance. Um, cognitive um, changes after cancer are also very common. Up to a 70 up to 70 percent of cancer survivors. Um, will describe changes in their memory concentration and thinking after a cancer diagnosis. And on formal neuropsychological testing, um, more, more are impaired than we would expect in the general population. Um, and many are not really informed about the possibility of cognitive changes at the time that they're diagnosed and start their treatment. And that can be quite a frightening thing to experience some of those changes and feel like you're not as sharp as you were before or not able to, to function at the same level. And it can um, those consequently negatively impacting on people's ability to function and their quality of life. Right now, unfortunately, we don't understand what causes the impairment and there's no good evidence to support any interventions um, to treat or prevent it. But I will give some suggestions in a minute about how um, things that people might try that are relatively easy. So once we've entered the world of cancer and even before, we're often assailed by the concept of war on, a war on cancer and all of the, the war images that are, go, that are associated with that. Um, and it equates to fighting for something. Um, and for some people, that's really not a very comfortable fit. And so a lot of what we talk about in the survivorship space is really working out what it is that, um, that suits you as an individual. So my preference is to think about um, living with cancer as a journey or a quest, and one that has challenges that need to be overcome that, that can be incorporated by changing our approach or our route. Our route. Um, but really it's about living with the cancer rather than um, against it. So some of the solutions um, to the problem of um, work-life balance um, may not be easy and our competing demands are unlikely to disappear, but there may be better ways that we can handle them. Um, so when we're talking about um, the solutions, plan I'd have to say that planning is one of the, um, the most significant things that we can do. It's really important to, um, to plan for any changes that we want to make and to, to plan to try and achieve that work-life balance. And some people need more help than others um, in planning for an, an enacting change. So it's a good idea to think about talking to healthcare professionals or a life coach or supportive friends. Um, when you're forming plans and working out how you might implement those effectively. Um, some of the other solutions that are helpful and I think that was really um, highlighted by Michelle earlier on was the, um, the sort of mindfulness approach, the living mindfully, thinking about what it is um, that we want to achieve, what's important to us and who is important to us. Um, and really making conscious decisions about um, who we'll spend our time with and how we will do that. It's about living in the moment and not thinking too far ahead or thinking too far behind, but experiencing and acknowledging um, the, the, uh, the, the, the way that you're feeling at that particular time. Um, so there, and in terms of um, it's sort of building on that a little bit further, is acknowledging the feelings that we experience is critically important. So there's no right or wrong approaches to living after cancer. After cancer. And there'll be times when our anxiety and fear is high and it's important that we can acknowledge that. Um, but at the same time, um, it helps us to recognise cancer as being one part of the journey but not the whole of our journey. Um, so the other, some of the other simple solutions which, well, they sound simple but in order to enact them they're not necessarily simple, um, is uh, to really be kind to yourself. So things will have changed. Um, your expectations and what you want may have changed as well. So um, 
take the time to think that through and work out what it is that you would like to do. If you want to start change, engage in new activities gradually and build your stamina up. Um, don't uh, you know, set goals that, you, that are achievable and, um, and that you can um, that you can fulfil and will keep you motivated to keep going. Um, think about what it is that you want and really consider whether your expectations are reasonable. Um, lots of people had emailed in questions about going back to work and that can be really hard. So have a think about who, what it is um, that people need to know and who, need, who knows that information already. Who else needs to be told about, the, you know, about what's happening with you and, and the impact that it may or may not have on your work in the future. Um, and again, it comes back to that having a plan. So having considered some of these things and maybe even tried out saying out loud how you would respond to someone who says, um, you know, asks you about your experience um, so that you're prepared for that and you've got the words ready um, because it's not always easy to respond in a way that you want to um, off the cuff. And consider working with um, psychosocial health professionals to help you do that to plan and follow up on, on how things go so that you can also implement changes. If you're feeling, if you are feeling anxious and or um, depressed and those feelings continue, do talk to your GP about referral for psychosocial support. Um, do all of the, the things that um, can help to, help to overcome that, particularly physical activity and getting out. But there is that psychosocial support that's available through um, GP um, care plans. Um, and in terms of sleep problems, if you're having trouble sleeping um, after you, your treatment's finished, particularly. Um, do seek some help for it. Um, we know that cognitive behaviour therapy is the most effective form of therapy for um, um, for sleep disturbance, and um, it's okay to use um, medications, and um, but it's best to use them sparingly. We know that they're not going to cure insomnia long term, so you're best to use them in combination with doing other things. Um, particularly cognitive behaviour therapy um, is very effective and it can be delivered either in groups or um, in, individual, uh, in individual settings or um, by nurses, psychologists. Um, there are uh, versions of it available online as well. So both things are there to be, um, to be accessed and helpful. Um, and in terms of fatigue, again, um, as I said earlier, physical activity is also really helpful in this situation. Um, and there are psychological interventions that can help people to adjust and, and to adjust their behaviour um, and to enact behaviour change to help them manage fatigue more effectively and to try and minimise that as much as possible. Um, if you're experiencing um, cognitive changes, and what we're really talking about are fairly, fairly subtle changes in memory and concentration um, and, and, um, and planning ability. Um, if Best, I think, to start off with um, seeking an assessment for anxiety and depression because those things are very closely related. Um, there are also um, neuro, um, neuropsychological assessments that are available, um, but through a neuropsychologist, they're um, fairly extensive and they usually have long waiting lists. If you just want to try other things out for yourself to see if it makes a difference, again, physical activity is one of the things that's bearing fruit as being one of the the potentially most useful solutions to um, cognitive changes. Um, there are some um, low cost, relatively low cost online brain training um, programs that can be used and there are also clinical trials that we're running that people can take part in for cognitive rehabilitation that, um, that, that might, be, might be helpful. Um, and in terms of managing the technology because it's become so ubiquitous, it's really there for all of us um, and potentially all of the time. Um, turn it off, take control of the, the technology. Um, it's really easy just to pick it up first thing in the morning and not turn it off again um, at all. Um, so um, some of the things that you can do are, are have some periods of the day where you don't touch the technology, it gets turned off and you respond to it when you, you go back to it when you want to rather than responding to it all the time. Um, keep it out of the bedroom. So. Um, you know, make your the place that you sleep a, an area which is completely separate um, for from the technology. Um, a lot of people attempt to a, have a um, what they call a, a luddite day, so a technology-free day where you go out and do something that does not involve screens or phones or computers or anything else. Um, and just remember that it's you who are the master of the universe, and we can make these things happen. But change is really not easy and you might need several attempts before um, achieving what it is that you, um, you want to achieve and getting to the stage you want to. And you might need some help to do that. 
Um, and I think I was going to stop there. Thank you, Haryana. That's, I think, some very useful information. So um, the polling question is, do you think that you would be able to apply some of the solutions that Haryana spoke of? So again, we've got a yes, no, and maybe, yeah, and sorry about the chat box. It looks like it was um, sitting in privatised mode, but please all feel free to chat and ask questions. And we welcome your questions. And um, when we get to question time, we'll try and address as much as we can. So that looks good. Thanks, everyone. And we'll move on to Erica now. Um, Just trying to move to the next slide. Whoops, here we go. So here's Eric James, who is Associate Professor of Public Health at the University of Newcastle. Welcome, Erica. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, before I um, jump into the slides, I'll um, just tell you a little bit about my situation and um, what went into when I was thinking about um, the presentation tonight. So I'm an academic, and my area of research interest is um, lifestyle change, so physical activity and nutritional change after people that experience cancer. Um, but personally, I'm a cancer widow. My husband died very suddenly from melanoma when our children were aged eight and five. Um, so when um, Cancer Council asked me to talk about this topic tonight, I really feel like there were the, the two big aspects of my life that, um, that went into um, thinking about the content that I wanted to cover. Firstly, um, my professional perspective of bringing together the very best research evidence about what we know is helpful, but also um, personally um, from the perspective of being the, um, the sole provider in a family that's been um, obviously very much impacted um, by cancer. So there's only 15 minutes um, for us to speak tonight and um, I could speak for a long time on, on all of the various aspects of lifestyle but behaviour change that, and different things that are potentially useful. Um, so instead of um, doing a, a poor job at lots of topics, I decided I'd um, give you my absolute best bet um, and what's the advice that I give people when they say what's the thing that you suggest I do that you think can make the biggest difference in successfully um, managing the post-diagnosis but also um, managing to um, keep the juggle in place of um, the multiple responsibilities and work-life balance. So I'll focus uh, predominantly on physical activity. I'm going to give you slide through some slides and give you my um, sort of uh, best sales pitch that I can um, in terms of hoping that you might consider um, increasing the amount of uh, physical activity that you undertake. Uh, but I want to spend most of the time on the hints that I've got for how do you make change. So, um, so that'll be the, the main emphasis on, um, on a, at the time this evening. So this little table here um, lists on the left, and this um, mimics very much what Haryana was talking about, the, um, the breadth of different um, symptoms and problems that people experience post-cancer. And um, the column on the right then, as you can see, that um, physical activity can be um, extraordinarily helpful um, across, um, across a whole range of different problems and symptoms. Um, I think you know, in the general community, we tend to think about physical activity as really only being useful if you're trying to manage your weight, for example. And uh, um, as Hariana pointed out, it's actually one of the um, most effective strategies that we've got for helping with fatigue and sleep quality, um, improving quality of life, improving anxiety and depression, for example. Um, and when I used to give this presentation, you know, even as long as short as five years ago, um, what I used to um, uh, say to people was being well, eating, uh, sorry, being active and eating well will help you feel better. But the evidence has really exploded now and um, we actually know that it can help prevent the cancer coming back and um, increase the amount of your life that is cancer free, um, which of course is disease free survival. So the general recommendations here are, um, are not going to surprise anybody. There's nothing going to, I don't think, that you would read down here and think I'm really shocked that that um, is related to um, remaining cancer free. Um, however, the one that I do want to um, bring to your attention, I suppose, um, is that bottom one in regards to sitting time and sedentary activity. So we used to think about um, our, um, our week in terms of um, how, counting how 
many minutes we were active and what sorts of activity that we do. And we now know that the amount of sitting that we do is independently associated with a whole lot of metabolic changes that, um, that occur and that there's a lot of benefits, even if it's not um, spending your time being active in breaking up those long periods of sitting. So I want to you know, make sure that I bring that to your attention and, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that um, as we go on. So let me convince you that it's worth it. Um, I know that there'll be some of you who'll be there saying, for goodness sake, we're here um, on this webinar because we're time poor um, and this girl is going to sit here and tell us to add another thing into our week and another burden and something else to feel guilty about. So um, there's uh, over 90 different types of cancer. I won't um, attempt to cover them all, but let me, I wanted to share a little bit of the research evidence with you about some of the main cancer types and the, um, the benefits in terms of um, preventing the cancer coming back and um, surviving and um, not, not dying from cancer for the different cancer types. So for breast cancer, you can see that there's some really big studies with many thousands of women who have been followed up for significant periods of time. This is not just six and 12 month follow up time periods. And we can see there that um, participation in physical activity is reducing the risk of that um, breast cancer coming back by 25 to 50% in some cases and 40 to 50% um, in some of those groups where they were doing higher levels of physical activity each week. So um, what about in bowel cancer? Again, we've got big studies um, with uh, people who's um, cancer um, at various stages of diagnosis and the more physical activities that they did post-diagnosis. So this is not about were, was I active in my life prior to cancer, this is after the diagnosis, is um, directly related to whether they're dying from cancer or dying from some other cause. And that's these terms that we would use in research about disease-free survival, recurrence-free survival, and overall mortality or dying from anything. Um, similarly, in prostate cancer, the men who are physically active have a lower risk of dying from any cause, including prostate cancer. And I think the, the useful part of these more recent studies is um, starting to get uh, give us an indication of well, how much activity are we talking about? So you can see there the men who walked 90 minutes a week, that's a week, not a day, um, at a normal to brisk pace, so that we're not talking about marathon running, we're talking about walking, um, and three sessions of 30 minutes um, a week had a 46% lower chance of dying from any cause. And the men who um, were able to undertake more physical activity, so three hours a week of more vigorous activity, when I use that term, I mean um, Huffing and puffing, you'd still be able to have a conversation, but you wouldn't be able to sing, for example, while you're undertaking vigorous activity, had a 49% um, lower risk of dying from any cause and 61% lower risk of dying from prostate cancer specifically. So you can almost half your risk of dying by walking at relatively small amounts. This is doable, sustainable levels of activity. If there was a drug that halved your risk of dying from cancer, it wouldn't matter how much it cost, it wouldn't matter what the side effects are on, you would all be prescribed it and everyone would be taking it. And that's how I think it's useful to start to think about your motivation for whether it's, um, you'd like to become more physically active. So briefly to touch on dietary change, um, again, the, this won't be surprising to you. Um, so there was a very big intervention study over you know, nearly 2,500 women um, with breast cancer um, who were followed up for five years, specifically to look at um, the impact of um, reducing uh, dietary fat. And um, you can see there resulted in a 24% um, lower risk of the breast cancer coming back. Um, Given the positive findings from that, they said, well, what if we you know, actually get people to really make extreme differences in their diet? So what if we set a really high fruit and vegetable consumption and a very low fat diet? So five serves of vegetables plus vegetable juice plus three serves of fruit, 30 grams of fiber and a small amount of percentage of energy from um, dietary fat. That's a tough call, that's a big dietary change. And the good news of that is there was no improvement in survival or breast cancer recurrence. So the message there is that it's not about really overhaul massive drastic changes, but doable, sustainable changes um, to your diet can successfully impact on these important um, outcomes that we're, that we're really interested in in terms of um, disease-free survival. So when I talk about physical activity, um, 
one size does not fit all. And I think the biggest message I would give as a behaviour change researcher is to say, find something that you enjoy doing and then you will find a way to fit it into your life. Um, we've all done that. I'll wait till Monday and I'll make a big change in my life and I'll tackle something. If you don't enjoy it, we know that it's unlikely to be sustained. So let me give it to you a taste of the sorts of um, things that you might want to consider. We would talk about aerobic activity as things like walking, cycling, swimming. We'd look for you to, you know, ideally be trying to aim to do that two or three times a week at a moderate intensity. So again, this is not um, at elite athlete, high level training. It doesn't necessarily have to be. If that's what you love, fantastic. But if you don't, then um, moderate intensity walking, swimming, cycling are fantastic. Try to make the bout, if you can, 20 to 30 minutes. If you haven't exercised for a long time and you haven't done it for a long time, start with small about, start with five and make a goal to 10. It's absolutely terrific as well. But you want to involve all the large muscle groups if you can. Um, resistance training is one that's growing in interest a lot for different people for a range of reasons. It can be enormously beneficial, um, especially for particular subgroups of people after cancer. If you've had any type of hormone therapy, um, where the result of those, um, for example, androgen deprivation therapy with men with prostate cancer, um, anything that impacts on bone density and bone health and loss of lean muscle mass resistance training can be terrific. And there's multiple ways to do it. It's not necessarily about having to join a gym, um, although of course that's one option. But using free weights, um, body weight exercises, for example, squats and push-ups um, are um, resistance training as well and there's lots of really neat devices out there that are very low cost that you can use at home as well. So resistance training recommendations we look are for um, one to three times a week and take a rest day so um, in between each session. Um, I'll skip over the dietary changes because they're really the standard recommendations that we would make for um, uh, cancer prevention generally. Um, so they're not that different to, um, to what we would all um, be aspiring to. Five serves of veggies, two serves of fruit. Um, be mindful about your alcohol consumption. Um, uh, limit energy dense, so high fat and high sugar snacks, and be aware of your salt intake. So this is, I guess, the part that I wanted to um, hopefully bring all of this together and, um, and share the evidence that says, you know, what does the research evidence tell us about how to make um, how to make changes in your life that um, that become habits and, and are sustainable and lifelong changes. And one of the big things um, links really nicely to what Hariana was saying about um, not only making a plan and but setting goals as well. About goals about small sustainable changes. So it's not about an entire overhaul of every um, part of your life, but maybe it's about making a decision that when you arrive at work, you'll actually park in the furthest row away from the door rather than driving around and around in a car park trying to get the closest park. Maybe the decision is about saying I get off the bus one bus stop earlier because that gets me, you know, extra steps in my day. Um, small sustainable changes that just become routine are much more likely to be maintained. Making an action plan and making the decision to say when and how and who am I going to exercise with and how am I going to incorporate that and fit it into this busy time poor week is um, one of the strategies that we notice when we follow people up, people who are able to continually maintain active lives tend to have action plans in place. Those where it falls off and, uh, and just gets lost are the ones who haven't done planning. Strategies that help you monitor your progress are enormously helpful and the obvious one I guess if we're talking about physical activity is the use of um, pedometers or other devices that help you get a sense each day of how much activity you've done. So um, they can be very low cost right through to very technical and, and very high, um, you know, lots and lots of data with accelerometers built into different devices and getting all sorts of feedback on energy expenditure and um, heart rate and, and, and different aspects and as simple as a pedometer that tells you about a number of steps and you can set a step count goal. So if you wear it for a day and you realise you're only getting 5,000 steps, try and get 6,000 tomorrow. The, benefit, the benefits will start to accrue as soon as you become more active and you can, you, the aspirational goal
goal that you would be getting to in that instance would be 10,000 steps a day. So monitoring your progress is really important. Um, enlisting support is also really important. This links back to um, what Michelle was saying about having um, working out who needs to know and how they can be most supportive. So if that means not having cakes at morning tea and um, being able to introduce new strategies at work like um, sit stand desks, um, treadmill desks, walking meetings, um, we um, in, in our workplace, um, unless there's a specific reason like somebody's on teleconference, we would um, we make our meetings walking meetings. It means the person taking the minutes walks with a dictaphone and records um, rather than uh, writing notes. And if the weather's good, we go outside and walk, um, you know, um, in a in a lovely environment. If the weather's not good, we walk up and down the corridors and up and down the stairs. And you know, so there's different things in terms of the workplace changes that help support um, the the strategy of being more active overall. Identifying barriers and problem solving um, is a really important um, behaviour change strategy in the literature. And this is about sitting there and saying, all right, my, my goal to uh, be more active this week is means that I'm going to um, get off the bus at, at one, step, um, one stop earlier and walk. What am I going to do on the days that it's raining? And identify the barrier, think about it and problem solve. Okay, I need to buy an umbrella that's small and compact enough that it's always in my bag so it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the weather is, for example. Or I'm going to have um, leave a pair of joggers at work um, because then on days when um, the shoes that I've got um, aren't uh, suitable that I've got a, a pair that makes it easier for me to be active. Um, one of the really useful strategies that um, survivors um, tell us uh, very frequently is about changing and um, in a sense thinking about activity as in a way you would in terms of multitasking. So if you normally catch up with friends for a drink after work on Friday, making that something that has physical activity involved. So maybe it means that instead of meeting for breakfast or meeting for a wine, you meet and you do an activity together. You go and do a yoga class or a stretch class or Pilates together. Maybe um, you walk in the park or you all go for a bike ride or something. So that people can get the tick off the different aspects of life that they're trying to achieve. Yes, they want to be more active, but that is that more or less important than maintaining my friendships or having quality family time. So thinking about ways that you can combine those together. You can see that I've used my time. So I'll finish with my my final hint. And I guess that I was thinking about this from the perspective of a lot of people. People often say to me, oh, I don't know how you do it, Erica. You know, you, we see you walking around and doing all of this and we know your situation at home and it's a demanding job. And what I say to them is, it's really important to change the time perspective by which you judge yourself. So if I got to the end of each day and went through a checklist and said, was I the mother that I aspire to be? Was I the work colleague that I wanted to be? Did I, was I a the friend that I wanted to be and the daughter that I wanted to be? Um, did I achieve in my career what I hoped to do? Often I would never, you know, I would never be able to tick all of those off successfully. But if I change the time scale to a week or a fortnight, then I can say, well, maybe I didn't do so well today on being mother of the year, but I know actually on Saturday morning I'm going to schedule something really special to do together and um, uh, and vice versa, you know, that um, when my children are away at something and an activity when in the middle of the school holidays here at the moment, um, that that's when I'll be able to put in that extra time and energy into another aspect. And so finding a way that allows you to, um, to I guess, take some of the guilt off yourself and, and um, cut yourself some slack, but still aspire to be the person that you want to be in all of the various aspects of your life and all of the roles that we all, um, that we all share. And so I guess my final message then is that, you know, please think seriously about whether some aspect of physical activity might make a positive contribution to your life and be worth scheduling and planning for to get that in there, regardless of what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And um, we'll move on to the polling question now. I can get that slide to go through. Um, so how many minutes of continuous physical activity is it recommended you undertake in a session? So 10 to 15, 20 to 30 or 30 to 50, it looks like everyone's getting it right. 
So as Erica mentioned, 20 to 30 is the, the correct answer. So thanks everybody. Um, and we've got five minutes left, so we're going to go powering through some of these questions. Um, so everyone's going to come back up on the screen. Um, and I think the first question, again, Erica, I think probably, is there any merit in eating a holistic organic diet for cancer? Um, so th maybe? There's definitely, you know, various definitions of, of the terms in that question. And, um, and I think the, the, the slides where I put up where I said, you know, it's actually about a well-balanced diet would fit very well with eating a holistic diet. There are a lot of people who are really interested in organic um, diets in particular. The research evidence as it currently stands internationally, the very best that we can do to look at people who eat organic um, fruit and vegetables compared to those who don't, we cannot see a difference in cancer diagnosis rates nor um, whether the um, cancer recurrence rate. But I preface that by saying is what you've got to do whatever makes it the easiest for you to engage. So if having if if growing your own fruits and vegetables is something that gives you pleasure and that is something that makes them more available, then I say fantastic. But personally my recommendation is I love any vegetable, canned, frozen, fresh, yeah. organic, not organic, you know, give it a wash, but Consume it would be my message. Yeah. So eat the veggies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also wanted to mention also with the questions that when people registered, we did get a lot of medical questions. Um, and it, it's not really the forum for us to be answering those medical questions. And if you have got those kind of concerns, you know, talk to your GP, your oncologist, your specialist, and and that's really the place you should be addressing those. So we'll move on. Um, I guess the next one, effective strategies to get motivated to push through barriers like low mood, tiredness and feeling overwhelmed. So Haryana maybe? Is that yeah, sure. I think, I mean, that's one of the challenges that faces everybody who um, is, is trying to overcome barriers to, to do that. But I guess the things that we can do are being realistic about what's achievable. So going back to that idea of, the, um, of setting goals that are small and achievable and sustainable. Um, so that you can do them even when you are feeling overwhelmed. And when you're confronted with um, tasks that look, make you feel like you're too tired to do it, try and break it down into something that's small enough so that you can start and make a, um, and, and actually get through it that way. Um, and I think, um, I, yeah, I, I think that's probably the, the most effective thing that I could suggest. I don't think there's any magic, um, magic bullets for anything else either, um, but it is just making it those small achievable things um, front of mind. Yeah. And I think in line with that question, the um, question second from the bottom about managing tiredness and, mm. and saying no when necessary. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's another thing, isn't it? It is absolutely. And I think that, that idea of actually, you know, practice, you know, being really having a plan and being clear about what's important to you can really help you say, actually, no, I don't want to do that and feel okay about it because you've thought about what it is that you're going to do with your time rather than that these are things that, uh, you know, that you have this immense um, amount of time that needs to be filled um, because you, you actually know that you've got things um, that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I think um, Erica kind of touched on the going back to work, avoiding habits and expectations of excessive work schedules and, mm -hmm. you know, as you're saying, the walking meetings and the you know, parking your car further away and, you know, um, if you've got an excessive work schedule, it's pretty hard. I mean, maybe that's the saying no again and negotiating maybe with your manager, how you're going to manage your work. That, they're all difficult. Nothing, as you said, Harry, I mean, nothing, none of these answers are easy. So um, I think the exercise during chemo is a question that comes up quite often, Erica. Can you maybe answer that one? Yeah, sure. Look. Um, most of the research evidence um, in exercise and cancer has been done on women with breast cancer. There's no question about that. There's certainly a growing evidence base in terms of colorectal cancer, prostate cancer and other types of cancer, but we know the most about breast cancer. We absolutely know that it's safe to exercise during chemotherapy and that women um, in particular, with women with breast cancer who are exercising during chemotherapy um, do not compromise the chemotherapy schedule. So one of the one of the concerns, I suppose, was 
would be would participating in an exercise program mean that I um, you know wasn't well enough and I didn't get as many rounds of chemo as expected. That's not the case. Actually, those who are active um, report lower levels of fatigue and better completion of the prescribed chemotherapy regime. And that evidence is growing all of the time. Of course, it's going to be individual, however. So we would, you know, um, and don't take it as something that then, you know, you start to test and go, oh, no, I didn't do that when I was only going into chemo or I'm doing it now and I don't think I can manage it. You know, every, every cancer is different. Every prescription for lifestyle change needs to be just as personally prescribed as the treatment regime itself. So if there's something that you're interested in and if you think that um, that's something that you can manage, absolutely it is really safe and you, there's a really good chance that you'll see some really positive um, impacts. Yeah, thanks for that, Erica. Now, we're, we're kind of at time. Um, so we're going to, there is a care, I mean, I'm quite passionate about the carer role and I'm sure you are as well, Erica. Um, so what, we, what we're planning on doing, I'll just move down through the next, um, slides where we've got some resources. Now this PowerPoint, somebody asked earlier about the PowerPoint. Um, this whole webinar is being recorded and will be put up on our website plus you'll get a link and you'll be able to view the PowerPoint and read all this information again, um, take it in and obviously look at these resources. Um, the resources that Haryana put there will pop up on the website as well so if you've missed those you'll be able to get those. Again, our information and support line 13 11 20, you can call that if you've got any questions. If there's any, for any reason, you need to speak to someone at Lifeline uh, 13 11 14. Um, we have an exit survey when we're finished, which we'd love you to respond to if you've got a few minutes. It doesn't take long, it's only about six questions um, and it's just a bit of feedback to help us for our future webinars. So we're delivering the you know, right information and um, doing it all properly. Um, now, if any of you are on Facebook, we are planning on continuing the conversation tonight. So, any more questions, um, we might not get back to you tonight with the answers, but we may be able to respond tomorrow. But all get on there and just chat amongst yourselves. So, if you go to the Cancer Council New South Wales Facebook page, there will be a post up there where you can continue the chat. So, that's about it. So, thank you so much Michelle, Haryana and Erica for coming on the webinar tonight. I think it's been great and um, as I said, pop onto Facebook and continue the chat. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.